Why is it that every time a company takes on Series C, they overscale and then fire half their sales team? <laughs> I don't know. That's a, that's a that's a good question. Is it a problem at the top? Is it a problem at the board level? Is it a problem at the investor level? Or is it a problem at the CEO level? Because it's not a problem at the sales level. All right, we're back. I'm Puyan from Scratchpad Riding Shotgun. We've got the one and only Ross. AKA Corp Bro, AKA Corp Daddy. AKA the best marketer in the world. Okay. <laughs> Super excited to have Brian Rosenblatt from Craft Ventures. And in uh, full disclosure, Craft led our Series A. Brian, from my understanding, you started off in media sales, went to Twitter, then to Reddit, and then jumped to a venture firm. So that's a really unique story and unique jump. So why don't we just start there? How'd you make the jump? You know, I was working at Reddit, um, building up the sales team in the New York office. And on the side was starting to, to invest in startups, kept writing these small checks. And after a while, these small checks added up and my bank account kept going down. And um, I realized I, I didn't have as much money as I, as I thought I did. And so what I started to do was start SPVs um, and I started to syndicate deals and kind of go to friends and family and different different uh, folks and colleagues and raise money on a deal by deal basis. I realized like that's where my energy was going. And fortunately, uh, someone from Craft, uh, Brian Murray, was was looking at AngelList, which is where I was running the deals, and, and reached out to introduce and got to know the Craft folks and and ended up joining from there. Yeah, you got you got me hopeful now because I've done that for nine nine different deals. Same thing, like small personal checks brought in friends, family, whatever, people in the network. You've been in, been on the ground. Obviously, you've been in sales. Do you find that that brings a unique perspective for you or something that gives you a leg up when you're making these investments versus just like a spreadsheet monkey who worked at Bain for two years? Yeah, 100%. Um, and you almost like... I, you almost don't realize it until you're in the trenches with someone who hasn't done it before. Like just the things I think as a salesperson or someone building out a sales team that may come naturally, or you've done it for 10 years, someone, you know, a founder who's doing this for the first time, like they, they don't know where to begin. Um, they may need to hire a salesman, you know, their first salesperson. They don't know what they're looking for. They're an engineer or a product person. It does make a big difference when you have folks on the other side that, that have been operators when you're the founder and, you know, I, I think it just, um, both when things are going well and they're not, there's just a whole different level of energy that comes with it. So there's, there's some folks that'll say being a venture investor is basically being in sales. What are your thoughts on that? I think, I think there's a lot of truth to it. I don't know if that's controversial or not, but you know, one, one of the things that got me really excited about venture was like a lot, a lot of the, the attributes that I think makes a good salesperson or sales leader, they really do translate to, to venture. And most people in venture capital, they don't come from sales. And so it was a really interesting opportunity I saw where like a lot of the things I was really good at, um, you know, were very different than a lot of the things other folks in, in venture was really good at. And some of the things that they were great at, I was not good at. A salesperson that's transactional and just like goes through customers, sells the thing and is out the door, that's not going to make a good venture capitalist. But someone who um, is thinking long term, who's listening to their customer, who's trying to understand, like, how can I help these guys be successful? That that is what I would say is like a, a great salesperson and could, could translate really well into venture. But, you know, you were kind of early on the sales team uh, at Reddit. Were there any kind of like massive moments where you guys were like this is it like we're, we're doing it like or or big personal wins on, on your end closing like the biggest deal? Like everything's the biggest deal when it's. Yeah. That early. There were, there was a, there was a couple, um, you know, one was, you know, when I, early on, when I joined, we, we closed the biggest deal in the, the company history then, which was a seven figure deal with a huge logo. Like the biggest deal before that was, was a 10th of that. But I'd say like the, the most fun part or, you know, memory was early on at Reddit, like we would go and meet a bunch of different brands. We'd meet CPG brands, L'Oreal, you know, different types of folks. And we would meet someone like L'Oreal. And they would be like, I love Reddit, but like, we're never going to advertise on this website. And, you know, a year later, a lot of work, marketing, this and that, they're signing up for, for big deals. And so we started to see this evolution of customers that were like, no way will our brand ever be on this, this website to them kind of chasing us to saying, we want to be the first one of this category to, to be on. That was 
that was always fun because it was something I think the sales team knew we could do, but we were just totally getting shut down early on. Nobody's posting all their misses on their website. Nobody, nobody came to speak to my business school classes about all the you know horrible investments they made. What have your been your biggest fuck ups? My 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 biggest mess ups were like the when I first started making um, personal investments, I did a bunch of them, and I, I sort of in my head was like, "This is my business school. Like, I if I lose this money, I lose this money. I'm figuring out if I am good at venture. I want to do venture, and so." I invested in a lot of companies uh, that looking back, I shouldn't have. And the, the the main mistake I made was it was an idea that I loved, I was excited about. And I didn't pay enough attention maybe to like the team or the competitive environment. I was just so excited to invest in a startup to be able to help these, you know, the, the team to put in some money. And I was like, this is, this is going to be great. A lot of those investments, um, you know, some, some have worked out really well and, and some have not. And that was the biggest learning is just, you know, they're, they're so, it's so hard to make a startup work. The team has to be great. The timing has to be, be right. Um, it can't just be like one of these things. Right. But there's a lot of folks that, you know, I've talked to that are interested in getting into sales at startups and there you, you get one shot, right? That's your time that you're putting into it. So would love to hear your thoughts for, for any of those folks listening. Like, how could they go about assessing a startup or an opportunity to see, hey, is this where I should put years of my time and energy? When I was looking for a new a new job, I met with a lot of people, a lot of companies. So it, it helped kind of, you know, help, help me gauge which companies were more prepared versus others. Um, and I kind of saw, I kind of had a good sense of the risk profile. But I was also like very deliberate as far as, you know, when I when I was at CBS, I, I was like, I want to go work for Twitter. Twitter was something I was using every day. One of the biggest deals I closed when I was at CBS, the reason I, I closed it and like learned about this, this opportunity was from a, from a tweet. Um, and so I think, you know, I think it's good for folks to just kind of take a step back and think about like the companies that interest them and where they want to learn and grow and to just figure out, figure out a way to get into that. Any, I guess, any learnings or anything you'd share on folks that are thinking of joining even earlier, right? Let's say startup, more like series a funded series b funded and thinking hey is this how, how would i even assess this in terms of investing my time here get a demo like would you buy it if you were your target customer like really think about that it's i mean it's not it's not fun and you're not going to do well trying to sell something you don't believe in i would talk to prospect you know uh potential customers and get their thoughts on the space um i think you know who your boss is so m- maybe it's the founder or a head of sales like, is this someone you're going to learn from? In some ways, that's even more important is like pick the people you're going to work with, not just the, the company or the product. It's really, I mean, it's really hard for people to predict what's going to take off or not. But if you, I think, align with the right people who, who are going to teach you and mentor you and that sort of thing, I think that's that's kind of a good way of assessing whether this is something that's gonna gonna work. Can you talk to us about like some of the best teaching moments you've had? When I was at CBS, we went through an exercise for all of our top top accounts, and we we're and the sales sales leadership was like write out the org chart, and everyone just wrote like their contact, you know, at, at the company, and that was kind of eye opening because it, it, it you know how many times does a salesperson say, oh, it's close to closing, but they have it stuck it with this person or that person or their boss or and so just understanding and like mapping out the org chart um, at all of our customers, understanding like how they make decisions, who could block it, who could accelerate it. And then based on that, like building relationships with those folks. I want to talk about like pitching a little bit because uh, you probably sit in a fair amount of those. And obviously that's what salespeople do. How, what are some of the best pitches you've seen? Let's just say for trying to get investment from you guys. And then, well, let's start there. I mean, I think, I think the best pitches are like pretty straightforward. Um, it's, this is who we are. This is what we're doing. This is why, and this is the product that frankly, like there's just a lot of, um, there's a lot of hand waving. There's a lot of big storytelling. Um, everyone has a vision of, you know, being huge, but like just trying to, to understand like why you're the right team and this is the right space, um, and just getting into it. So, so Ross, um, Th- that means I know you, you recently came out of the MBA program. That means washing away some of that MBA speak. Oh, you mean just just dropping yeah. my Stanford MBA doesn't give me money? Yeah. It's like it's like it's like a, it's like if you guys have ever watched like Shark Tank, Mark Cuban always freaks out when someone's like, "Our oh, you so know, much. there's if we only get one percent of this audience, it's a ten billion dollar and he, like numbers like that. You know, they could be fine to look at and understand it's a big market, but when someone's leaning on that and saying 
all we need is 1% of this huge market and it's great. It's That's not super, super helpful. Yeah, I'm trying to think because I, th- I there's so many folks in sales who like want to start something, but they're just like, I have no fucking clue how, like how do I even go about raising money or like f- building a team or just like getting started. And I think that's, obviously that's a lot of what we talk about here is how do you take that first step? Puyan, like this could even be a better question for you is like, what what is that first step? Like where do you, you got an idea or you've got your yeah. problem, you've got an idea, like where the hell do people go? Well, I think, you know, to support Brian's point on cutting the bullshit and just getting to getting to the substance. And this is where, you know, in I feel like in Silicon Valley, so much is celebrated around building and product. And it's so easy to spin your wheels and build the wrong thing. Listen, I we me and my co-founder made that mistake. We've been building stuff for nine years. And so what we actually did with Scratchpad early on is before we built anything, we just tried to sell it. You know, we knew we couldn't maybe get the actual dollars or signed contract, but say, can we generate any demand, right? Can we come up? And, and this was like what a lot of SDRs might be doing. And I mean, can we write, can we write some copy and can we find the right audience and communicate to them, reach out to them such that we just get any signal? Like, would anyone be willing to take a meeting with us for this problem? Yeah. I, and, and that actually brings up a good point. Like one of the attributes I think of really good salespeople like it's not just selling, it's kind of getting feedback relevant for the entire team, product feedback. And so like a good salesperson could go in and understand why they're not going to make the upsell or get the client because of like what reason um, and could kind of, you know, come back and communicate that clearly, clearly to product and leadership and actually change that. One other exercise we did was we just fast, we just assumed whatever it was, we could build it. So then fast forward and say, okay, well, how are we going to sell it? Who are we going to sell it to? What's our angle? What's our messaging? What's our positioning? And that's where I feel like those, the sales skills really can come in valuable. I, again, I just feel like maybe a lot of folks don't know that that's a perfectly fine starting point. It's not about building right away. So it sounds like it's go out there and sell the idea, try to sell the idea to a bunch of people and see that type of feedback you get and yeah. possibly make some changes or get the confirmation you're looking for. Exactly. And I think that that then supports like, who is this problem even for? Are they, is the market looking for something like this? Is there a huge gap that everyone else has missed? There you go, folks. Go actually do something. Go, go sell anyway. Go keep selling. Go sell your yes. own idea. So just to switch it up though, Brian, like one, one of the things I learned about sales early on was we were hung up on and I mean, we did everything from cold calling to visiting SMBs, like going going up and down the, the street to, to different stores. And, and I feel like that resilience honestly has helped a ton as, as a founder. But how does it feel for you to be on the side being rejected to now on the side of doing a lot more of the rejecting. That, that part is not fun at all. And there, there's a lot of it because, you know, most of the founders we meet, we don't, we don't fund. Um, but yeah, I think it's important to kind of develop thick skin and like, it's not, it's not personal. I saw some of the best salespeople and senior people. And when I did internships with someone who was like, you know, super successful now, they would talk about getting hung up on or the door slammed in their face. Like everyone gets rejected. You know, again, if we go back to the, how does sales help with building something or even thinking about building something, there's so much to learn in those rejections if you can get to the why. And, and there's always an opportunity to, to kind of turn those no's into yeses. Like, you know, the example I said with Reddit and L'Oreal, they were like laughing us out of the office. A year later, they're, you know, writing us a big, a big check. Yeah, the old... No doesn't necessarily mean no in sales. If you don't believe that, then you're going to have a hard time selling your product. I, I feel like there's, you know, like if you like, you have, there's a lead list, like there's, you know, there's people that are qualified and they say yes, and you move on to the next step. And then there's like the, the no's and some of the, some of the no's are kind of like the see you later. like, let's check back in a month. Let's wait a little bit for X, Y, or Z. So I have, a, I have like a super pressing question. I think it's probably the one everybody's wondering. Is it like a prerequisite just to look absolutely fire in your LinkedIn photo to work at craft or, or is that just like a, a byproduct of working there? Cause that's a by, wall, it's a byproduct. Just, once once, oh once you, once you accept the job at craft, it just, it just happens. Any, any big trends you're seeing or anything that in like, how, you know, the quote unquote, how is sales changing? Right. I know there is the craft is, is really known for uh, bottom up, like investing in bottom up style companies. Is, you know, do you see that being any different in terms of like the type of salesperson or the type of sales motion to other types? Like, you know, for folks that are thinking about, hey, like I'm only a year or two into sales, 
where, what direction could this go? Where should I maybe invest more time in or other types of companies to look at? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're seeing more and more bottom up um, sales strategies. And so, you know, when I say bottom up, I basically mean um, customers or prospects are signing up on their own for a product. It could be like a free trial or a demo or a starter account. Um, and then those leads are being funneled to the sales team who are trying to get them to sign on for a bigger deal um, or enterprise deal. Um, their their biggest challenge is not the leads, it's converting those leads into bigger deals. Why is it that every time a company takes on Series C, they overscale and then fire half their sales team? <laughs> I don't know. That's a, that's a, that's a good question. Is it a problem at the top? Is it a problem at the board level? Is it a problem at the investor level? Or is it a problem at the CEO level? Because it's not a problem at the sales level. But before you IPO, it's one way. You, then the company IPOs and they promise certain growth metrics. And then like, you know, it goes from the CRO to the VP. To, and all of a sudden you've got a quota and you're looking at it and you're like, this is just, this is like, not just not realistic. And I think so, some companies are smart enough to realize like when they messed up and like pump the brakes and fix it and others aren't. Um, and I mean, that that's where it gets really unhealthy because the salespeople aren't happy. And then the company just starts spending like crazy to meet their sales goals. So they hire way more salespeople than they should, you know, who are bringing yep. in more revenue. But yeah, I mean, that's, that's what you want to avoid. It's a, it's a tough one. There's always this golden age. Like, you know, you picked your companies very, very well, right? Like you got there right at the beginning of the golden age, product market fits looking good, but there's all these folks who see these names, you know, that are, that are hiring like crazy, but like the golden era is kind of done and they don't know that it's like, Oh, all the reps are hitting, but you know, we're hiring 500 people this quarter. It's like, that's a red flag for now. After my experience, like big red flag, like I'm not touching a company that's going into that stage. Cause all of a sudden the totally. territories are getting spliced demand where's demand demand just going to magically like 5x 10x the company keeps having the best quarters ever but the reps keep having the worst quarters ever and like the split like reps start to tail off and companies you yeah know. totally and that 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 sucks for everyone and then the best those great salespeople leave and they're going to go somewhere else and right. eventually like they're going to crush it at a company and do better and it will work out but yeah it's it's um it's it's unfortunate because it's oh it's a lose lose for for everyone but if you're a rep and all of a sudden your quotas increase to some on unachievable number like what's the what's the right play there make sure make sure your you know manager and management knows where you stand on that and something at some point like something something's got to give and most likely it's not just you who's feeling that there's going to be other reps feeling that having the same conversations and when that happens i mean management's going to have to have to do something they can't have every rep missing and being upset unless you know that's what they do and that's probably a company that's not going up and to the right. I feel like we got to ask our our question or a couple questions. And the first one is, Brian, what's what's your go-to pump up jam? We're building a playlist of everyone who comes on here. We're getting all the jams. We're going to get your pump up and then we're going to get your sorrow. Okay. So pump up jam, I'm going to go with uh, Flo Rida. Good feeling is the name of the song. Okay. Okay. I don't have a sad song. You just don't get really? sad. There's no, there's no like, you know, after you, you've just been, it's like a punch the gut and the face at the same time with the deal. There's no I, the energies drained from my body. I can't even like press play on music. I'm like on my bed, head down. I just, I just don't function. Just wailing into why a pillow. Yeah, Ross, why don't, we'll fill it in. Maybe with like a Hans Zimmer soundtrack or something. Oh, right? The wheat from uh, Gladiator. Gladiator, yep. That'll get you jacked <laughs> up. That'll bring you back. Brian, thank you for joining us. Thank you guys for having me. This was fun. Yeah, thanks for joining, Brian.